Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reality Bites, episode six. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Rajiv Malhotra, and we are going to be discussing an extremely important issue. Should Hindus be using the term Hindu phobia or the term Hindu mesia to talk about the historic persecution and the hate that Hindus have been facing globally and at home? So thank you, Rajiv, sir. Thank you for talking to me for the second time. This is an honor, uh, Rupur. Uh, Rupur, you are very articulate. You're very clear thinking, and uh, you're getting right to the point, and you don't hesitate pushing uh, uh, on a topic. And so I'm looking forward to this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raji. So thank you for sparing your time. Uh, we know you're extremely busy. Now, um, I think the Hindu community on the whole has historically missed the significance of lexicon and the words that we are supposed to use to articulate our historical persecution. So how important do you think is lexicon in defining our problems in a manner that the global community sort of understands what the Hindu community has gone through historically for the past 1000 plus years? You know, brand names, are a substitute for going deep into a, into an issue, into a product. Uh, if you know a certain brand is means a certain thing, it could mean a very expensive brand. It could mean very inexpensive brand. It could mean very reliable brand. It could mean a brand for you know young girls. It could mean whatever. So a brand is a is a is a term that conveys a whole message in one phrase, one word. And this branding, people spend a lot of money creating these brands. And then it becomes part of your uh, your unconscious, the, the consumer's unconscious. So when that brand is invoked, it brings out a whole lot of messages, a whole lot of assumptions. So similarly, words can be branded. You can, you can, and, and the West is extremely good at that. The left in particular has been very good at coinage and coming up with brands. And, you know, so we haven't done that in today's world we used to do it in the ancient past we people were very skillful in the use of language but today we've taken the back seat you know even things like uh, are we right wing i mean i don't think we are right wing uh, or left wing i i i am flying on both wings i mean i don't see i, well, I have to make a choice and and if you lo really look at the meaning of right wing in the context of how it started in the West, it really doesn't apply to us. But we've accepted that. So we're accepting the coinage that others have come up with and rather than creating our own. And therefore, we are sort of a, a consumer of somebody else's framework and, in fact, empowering it by the by merely using it. So I, I think you've raised a very important point. We need to take control of the discourse, and that includes coming up with the right terms, the right phrases. Some of them are old ones we have to revive. Like we've talked about, in my case, we've talked about Purva Paksha. It's an old term, but we've, we've revived it and it's become very powerful. So, and then some are new terms that we have to coin. So, As you said, the left does this really effectively. They've understood that the lexicon is a part of a strategy where you can articulate a subliminal messaging uh, to the entire world without really saying it. Now, for example, in the Delhi anti-Hindu riots, where there was an entire conspiracy to burn Hindus, to murder Hindus, and to teach Kafirs a lesson, the global left managed to package it as an anti-Muslim pogrom. Now, they didn't use the word genocide, they didn't use the word massacre, they specifically used the word pogrom because it tells the global community that the Muslims are essentially the new Jews that are being cleansed by the Hindus. It, it alludes to the massacre and the cleansing of Jews in Russia and Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th century. Now, a lot of average consumers, readers, viewers would not particularly understand the importance of using that word pogrom by the left. But it did the job for the global community. It did the job for the power corridors that the left was trying to um, huckle to. So how important do you think and how do we really balance using terminology that the average consumer, reader, viewer can understand versus terminology and lexicon that is necessary for the subliminal messaging that you need to send out globally to make sure that you're, you, know, you can mainstream the conversation and narrative around your own persecution. 
You know, I think you've uh, framed the uh, issue very nicely. There is a, a explicit communication, which uh, people understand. And then there is a subliminal, implicit kind of unconscious communication. And this is very important. Now, there are legal consequences also. So if you if you were to use the word pogrom, as, as in your example, and this catches on, and, uh, you know, most people don't know too much. They don't have a whole lot of knowledge. They, they cannot... Uh, uh, you know, factually agree or disagree, but the, it's a it's a nice credit is nice term used by some credible people uh, with some good affiliations. They come from very prestigious uh, media, so you know it, it it has a it has currency. It gets currency, and once it gets currency, it gets traction. Then it travels, and you know far and wide, it becomes part of the curriculums in in universities. Students start using it. Media people casually use it. So it becomes common, it becomes sort of like a default position. In other words, in a conversation you're having, when people want to look like they're very smart, they will start quoting these things because they assume that it's a given. It's, it's sort of like uh, the normal position that become, it becomes the normal. You see, that's the problem, that these terms become like the normal way of referring to something. And we have suffered a lot, so I think Making this uh, problem, uh, bringing our people's attention to this problem is very serious. So what do you think is more important? Using lexicon and terminology that your average reader in India can identify with? Because we are talking about um, Hindu persecution historically. So should we be using terms that your average reader in India your average Hindu in India can understand and relate to, relate to? Or should we be more careful using these terms which send out a message to the global community as to what we are trying to say? Like the left did with the Delhi riots, they specifically use the word pogrom unanimously and universally. Every Islamist, every leftist, every media house that spoke about the Delhi anti-Hindu riots and they wanted to prove that it was against the Muslims, they specifically use the term pogrom so, uh, for reasons we discussed. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, as, as you mentioned, there are two audiences and there are two purposes, and both are important. I mean, you definitely want to bring your own people along. You want to speak in common uh, language that they understand. Uh, whatever is the Aam Admi buzz, you know, whatever will go, work for them. Uh, and, and then you also want to speak to the global community because you want to have an influence there. You want to counter because we have been very lazy our hindu leaders worldwide those who are those who are in positions of official uh, formal uh, appointment uh, whether they are with the sangh parivar whether they are with the government or whether they are the gurus these are the people who got adhikar they got the authority in the eyes of the world they have not done a good job of this of messaging uh, for the global consumption they have not done that and so individuals like us can do so much but we do not have the official, we're not official, uh, uh, officially authorized to represent a culture. So if uh, if there's a debate on CNN, I can get in on merit, but then they'll say, well, you're talking about, you're only representing yourself. The Indian ambassador is not willing to come. Guru X and Y is not willing to come. The Sangh people don't go up, go out, go there and do this. They feel embarrassed. And so the, the people with the Adhikar are not doing this job. And so ordinary people are doing the best they can. Now, there is this need in the global messaging to, to use terms which will work. It is practical. It is not a question of what does it literally mean. It's a question of will it work? Can I piggyback on a trend? So pogrom is a trend. It's a very powerful word. It's a vicious word. So can I piggyback on that? And you see, it's not about whether it really was or wasn't a pogrom, but that's what works. So I would say that the pragmatics of the situation are twofold. There is a pragmatic in the domestic, you know, Aam Admi marketplace of ideas. You want to bring those people along. You want enough of that support for various reasons. And you also want to explain to the global community, which is very sophisticated, and they have their own kind of, uh, you know, language, so to speak. And you need to understand what exactly are they saying, reading between the lines. What are the implications of what they are saying? And how should we counter it wisely? So there are both those uh, domains. So it's interesting you spoke about us identifying as right wing, because essentially, if you really go by the definition of right wing, it would be the Islamists who should ideally be called right wing and not Hindus. Yes. 
Yes. And we've um, very happily accepted that tag, uh, sadly. Well, you so know, you know, the, if you yeah. if you look at uh, if you look at the the classically what the left wants, I mean, they want egalitarianism, and Hindu dharma is very egalitarian. Uh, if you look at what is a liberal in the in the American sense, a liberal goes to, is a vegetarian goes and does yoga and all these things, and they are part of this new age liberal. Well, that is all Hindu stuff. In fact, it came from here. So how come they've taken many Hindu ideas and practices and philosophies, incorporated them as at the very heart of being a liberal, a liberal white person, and yet at the same time branded us as some kind of right wings and fascists and all those things. This is something our, our thought leaders must pay attention to. How is this happening and how do we counter it? In fact, it was very interesting to me that uh, during this Israel Hamas war, um, there were individuals from the left and the Islamist nexus who were going on to brand the Jews as fascist and uh, <laughs> Hitlerist. So it was very interesting to me that um, you know they would talk about the Jews who are being persecuted and call them. Um, you know, with the epithets that they gave to the very man who persecuted them uh, years ago and decades ago. So it was very interesting to me how this play of words uh, takes place. So Raju, so you and I have been going back and forth on this discussion about the usage of the word Hinduphobia versus the usage of the word Hindumisia. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get into that discussion, I'd like to give a short primer for all our listeners who might not know. Phobia is essentially an uncontrollable, irrational fear of either an object, a person, a group of people, a situation, etc. So um, you have a fear of heights, it's called a phobia. You have a fear of spiders, it's called a phobia. And Hindu phobia essentially means a phobia of Hindus, which is an irrational fear of Hindus. Um, phobia, of course, comes from, I believe, the word phobos, which means fear. It's, um, and the opposite of that would be philia, which is love. Um, on the other hand, misia, Hindu misia, it comes from the Greek word. Misia comes from the Greek, <coughs> ancient Greek word misos, which means hatred. Now, misia is generally used as a prefix rather than a suffix. Mm -hmm. So when you hear of words like misogyny, misanthropy, etc., it plays on the word misia. Now, the debate is that should we be using the word Hinduphobia or the word Hindumisia to talk about our historical persecution, to talk about the hate speech, etc., that Hindus encounter on a regular basis. Now, before we go into Hindumisia and talking about the differences in the two terms and what should be used, I think it would bode well for all of us to understand how and why Hindu phobia as a term started being used. And uh, Ra Dr. Raji was one of the first people and one of the early adopters of the term Hindu phobia. And so, sir, could you tell us why you thought that Hindu phobia would be an appropriate word to talk about yeah. the kind of persecution that Hindus face? Yeah, I think. And how uh, long ago did it start and why did it come about? Yeah, so in the 1990s, when I was looking at, uh, you know, all kind of bias in the school systems, and the bias is not just hatred, bias also includes fear. I mean, they, they are basically saying if Dalits have fear of Brahmins, Muslims have fear of Hindus, minorities in India are persecuted by Hindus. That is all fear. That is all like, uh, you know, to accuse Hindus of pogroms is to instill fear. I mean, the whole uh, work is based on fear that we are people of privilege. We come from, we have structures of privilege. The Vedas are oppressive. The word, the whole idea of oppressor, oppre oppressed. Oppressor is the one who's oppressing you and oppressed is the one who's a victim. That is the Marxist language in which wokeism is being defined. And Hindus are considered the oppressor. Well, if you are oppressor and I'm oppressed, obviously it is, has to, I have to fear you. Obviously, it is. So the, 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 uh, it is not like fear is not there. It is definitely there. And the, the dismantling Hindutva is not because they are irrational people and they're a bunch of useless, you know, unscientific idol worshippers. That's not a reason to dismantle them. 
the dismantling is because uh, because they are a threat to society. They are actually a menace. They are actually a threat to society. And when you get the U.S. State Department and all kinds of people going to the Indian government and saying, you know, we don't like this and we warn you and this and that, and you're a human rights oppressor. Well, that is because that all that is instilling a fear of Hindus. So it, the Hindu phobia, even in the literal sense of the word phobia, is valid. It is a, it is happening, and I don't think we should deny that that the Hindu phobia is real. It exists, and we should fight back. As far as the history is concerned, in the 90s. When I was tracking these things, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, fond of learning new stuff and meeting new friends and particularly understanding how other people are playing the game. So I studied the Japan Foundation, the Korea Foundation, how they are working in this country, Tibet House, uh, the China Institute, you know, the, all, how they're working. And, and the Islamic, uh, there was a Council on Islamic Relations uh, you know, and Education. I became friends with a lot of those people. One of the persons was Akbar Ahmed. Now, he is a Pakistani, uh, and he was the Pakistani High Commissioner to UK. And after he retired, this is some decades ago, he came to the United States as a visiting professor at Princeton University, right in my neighborhood. So we became friends. Uh, he would take me out to lunch. He came to my house. We became very good friends. In fact, very nice, decent, gentle, soft-spoken person, like a diplomat would be. Now, one day he invites me to a book launch or something, some big book event in Princeton University, where they're going to give an award to somebody who has who has uh, exposed uh, Islamophobia. I wasn't familiar with that term. So I said, what is this going on? He said, well, you know, we want to create a whole movement and we want to coin the term Islamophobia and create a whole movement to, to a pushback uh, against those who are criticizing us and belittling us and, and all that stuff, all the all the negativities that people are spreading about Islam, we want to brand it Islamophobia and fight back. So one of the things that they were doing was uh, giving a book award every year to whichever person, in, especially they would pick a leftist and give them a lot of rewards if they exposed what was considered Islamophobia. So I thought this is very interesting, very clever. I mean, uh, earlier in our conversation, we discussed the importance of coining words. And I figured this is what these guys are up to. So I figured, I told him, I said, you know, but all the examples you're giving of uh, people uh, making fun of Muslims and uh, in schools they're being bullied uh, and so on, somebody makes fun of some symbol of theirs. We face that too. We Hindus face that too. So he said, well, but then that's up to you to do something about it. So I came home and I did a search on Hindu phobia. And I thought, you know, if there's a lot of Islamophobia, because he showed me on his computer, there's a lot of Islamophobia discussion going on. So I thought there would also be Hindu phobia. It's a very natural thing. You replace the word Islam with Hindu. And, and I found there were no hits at all. There were no hits. It was not a term being used. Now, decades later, someone told me that Hindu phobia had been used in the 1800s or something. Maybe maybe it had been, but it wasn't in active use. It certainly wasn't in active use uh, in the context I was in. So for me, it was a brand new innovation to coin the term Hindu phobia, even though later I found out that somebody had used it long ago, but it be became out of use. So that's how the term Hindu phobia started. Everywhere he would go and talk about Islamophobia, I would sit in the audience and I would raise my hand and say, you know, can we also can we also take on Hindu phobia the same way? And they would and I would give examples, very similar examples to the ones he was giving. If he would give examples of school children being bullied, uh, Muslims, I would give examples of Hindu children being bullied. If he would give examples of stereotyping in the media, making fun of them, I would give the same examples. So I piggybacked on the uh, activism of the Islamophobic uh, movement and gained currency. So we became very successful. Uh, people today, everybody in the media who's a Hindu knows the term. It's, uh, it's the result of about 30 years of using it. So coinage and using creates brand value because a lot of people start using it. The biggest benefit to uh, the term Hindu phobia was when people we call Hindu phobic, like Wendy Doniger and all these kind of people, started getting scared of it. They started saying, oh, I don't want to be called Hindu phobic. You know, if I say this, they'll call me Hindu phobic. I better avoid it. So our opponents and our targets of, of Hindu phobia started giving us value 
by taking it seriously. I mean, they could have trivialized it and not made, not taken it seriously. But they started attacking me. I got personal attacks all over the place, uh, every all, every which way, uh, all kind of allegations against me because I coined, I branded them Hindu-phobic. So I knew I'm on to something because if you if you call the opponent something and it really hits him hard, then you know you're on to something. So I decided that this 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 must continue, and that's how we built a whole movement around it. And so we own the term Hinduphobia.com, and we have uh, several books on it, Academic Hinduphobia. My focus was academic Hinduphobia, because I, I'm able to show that that is where knowledge starts, and it goes into the school system, then they teach journalists, and then it uh, media Hinduphobia. There's a lot of Hinduphobia in the media, in think tanks, in uh, policy making. You see, so uh, this has been a successful uh, coinage for us. I'll tell you how we used it effectively. Uh, about a, a year or two ago, there was a bill in the United States Congress uh, uh, banning Islamophobia and making it a criminal offense. It would not be just a bad manners and bad etiquette. It would be a federal crime uh, 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 to be applied worldwide. And the bill said, that uh, a special cell should be installed uh, to monitor Islamophobia worldwide, and this should be part of the State Department. So this would be like a, like a whole uh, surveillance, worldwide surveillance. And, and if, if this became law, then if people, somebody like you said something about Islam in India, you know, and they put a case on you, then this United States uh, State Department would prosecute it. I mean, whether they could succeed is another matter, but they would internationally prosecute it. And this would become a federal crime in the United States. Now, this is a very serious matter. You know, I have put this out in my book, in my some recent books also. The bill passed the lower house. It passed the Congress with one vote opposing it and the majority agreeing with it and a large number of people just abstaining from it. So it passed. And that's very big, that's big news. But in the Senate, uh, Senator Cory Booker, an African-American New Jersey senator, I know him well. I have funded his uh, campaigns. We know each other. I've supported him in the past. He put it on the floor. And I was so disgusted because I don't think he knew enough about it, about the whole all the ramifications. So I put out a counter to that. And this is where I said, if if you want to ban Islamophobia, you should also ban Hindu phobia. Why is one religion more important than the other? Had I started with Hindu Misia, they could have said, okay, it's not the same thing. You see, but when I say it, Islamophobia has these is is a problem. If somebody is accused, then there should be these consequences. Then, by the same token, Christian phobia, Hindu phobia, Buddhist phobia, Sikh phobia, etc., should also be. And that's a way to win an argument. Because now I, I convinced people like Senator Cory Booker, his office people, that if that you would be you would be insulting Hindus by only patronizing and protecting Muslims from this Islamophobia and not giving Hindus the same uh, same benefit, and and uh, uh, it, 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 so therefore you should broaden the language. Now the moment you the moment the Senate people started thinking about, okay, let's also ban Hindu phobia, the whole deal died. Because the people who were into it behind backing it were that was the uh, leftist Islamic conspiracy, the, that nexus of the leftists and the Islamic. And the last thing they wanted to do was to be on the radar with people like me accusing them of Hindu phobia. Okay, then they felt that this whole thing will backfire. So the, the bill died. And that's a success we, we pulled off. It, we haven't received a whole lot of uh, publicity for it, but we pulled off the success by simply putting Hindu phobia on par with Islamophobia very successfully. And the legal people said, yep, this makes sense. Uh, they, if they want to do Islamophobia, then they should also do Hindu phobia. And then the, the whole deal collapsed. So I'm giving you examples where I have been able to use this uh, in uh, schools, in uh, university debates, uh, in on, uh, on media. And I feel that the people who are promoting Hindu Misia do not have that experience. I'm sorry, they're good people. I'm sure they mean well. Uh, but they haven't had this 30, 40 years of experience of getting out, getting out of their own, uh, you know, cocoon and into the mainstream and fighting battles and coming back successfully. I haven't heard them win a single battle. 
and I think that if you start up the if you start this new Hindu Misia bandwagon, you'll confuse people. We lose the 30 years momentum we've built, and we'll have to start all over again. And I'm not happy with that. So um, before we move on to Hindu Misia, now especially after the Israel and Hamas war and all of that, you do see this sort of momentum in trying to talk about radical Islam and talk, you know, sort of counter radical Islam. And for the past few years, there has also been certain momentum in trying to say that Islamophobia is a myth. Now, we all know that Islamophobia as a term was popularized by the Muslim Brotherhood to skirt any sort of criticism of Islam. Now, when we talk about Islamophobia, we the, the obvious counter to that is that the fear of Islam is essentially not irrational, given the history of Islam uh, for so many centuries, the beheadings, the rapes, the wars, the, uh, the, the campaign against Kafir, the jizya, and all of that, the, the kind of unbridled violence. The fear of Islam is not irrational. If you don't fear Islam, you end up like Mahashay Rajpal with your head not attached to your torso, essentially. And therefore, the fear is not irrational. Now, the moment you start talking about Hindu phobia, it's almost as if the two can't really go hand in hand. So you can't particularly say that Islamophobia does not exist and attempt to discredit that extremely draconian word which skirts any sort of criticism. And at the same time, use the same lexicon to talk about the persecution, the historic persecution and hate speech against Hindus. So how do we rationalize that? How do we continue to use the word Hinduphobia and so, yet continue our efforts to discredit the draconian Islamophobia bandwagon? So, you know, you have to update your knowledge. Our, our people need to update their knowledge with the book Snakes in the Ganga, uh, where we are, we're explaining the woke movement is attacking us by accusing us of being uh, of uh, they are actually saying that dalits are suffering from hindu phobia dalits are the targets and uh, victims of hindu phobia look at the language oppressor oppressed now oppressor is to be feared so so nupur you are being called oppressor your culture is an oppressor so how can you say they're not accusing you of phobia or, or, or they're not having phobia they are uh, they are making the allegation that you are creating Hindu phobia in me, the Dalit, or me, the Muslim. You are, I, you want me to be afraid of you. The, you are, you come from the oppressor community, and you have Sanskrit language is an oppressive language. It was not, we, it was used by the Brahmins to oppress the Dalits uh, and and women. Uh, so there is oppression of women. There is oppression of Dalits. There is oppression of Christians. There is oppression oppression of uh, Muslims. So basically, the entire uh, dismantling Hindutva, dismantling Hinduism, attack on Hinduism is based on a theory of oppression. And how can you, an oppressor not be uh, feared? So I don't think that you can decouple fear. You see, negative is, is a very loose term. You can be negative. You can be negative and say, I, they, I don't like their uh, idols and they are very ugly people and they're, they're, they do all these weird things and these uh, mumbo jumbo pujas they do don't make any sense and their symbols are, you know, that is, I mean, people have a right to say all that and make fun of each other. But this becomes a legal allegation against Hindus because of the charge that you are oppressors. And because the whole human rights movement internationally, these UN and all these kind of people, they have accepted this. You know, this uh, uh, Sundare Rajan, the lady who's uh, done this uh, uh, this uh, equality labs, uh, she's, going, she's gone and presented uh, her entire thesis on why Hindus are violent and why uh, the whole Hindu dharma from the, uh, the text from the Vedas She's gone and done workshops at uh, World Bank. A six a six part work workshop for the uh, uh, paid her a lot of money. I have the videos for that from that, where she says that World Bank should make it part of the policy when it gives a loan, when it finances 
uh, international loans in various countries, it should look for whether there is something like Hindu phobia going on. And so if, if a certain, uh, or a certain uh, government or some organization somewhere in India were applying for a World Bank loan, one of the criteria should be, are they practicing Hindu phobia? And the, who would be evaluating that? Well, it would obviously be uh, NGOs, these leftist Muslim type NGOs, they would be the ones giving World Bank a, a report. And so what would happen if that became law, if that became policy, is that it would affect the financing availability uh, for Hindus because they would all be considered saffron and Hindu phobic, I mean, uh, violent people because they are oppressors. So I would say, look at the thesis, the theory behind wokeism, and you will, you cannot escape the, the allegation of being oppressor, of being, you know, the, 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 the party, the group, the identity that is creating victimhood in the rest of the people. So that I would say that it may be our wishful thinking, that people just hate us because they because of reasons of logic. Maybe they don't understand our religion and all that. But let me tell you, uh, things have changed in the last 30, 40 years. When I use the term Hindu phobia, uh, you could argue to some extent that there isn't real phobia being propagated, but it is just sort of a jokingly, they'd say that these, this and that happens. Although there were con women's conferences all the time, all the time for saying that unless you dismantle the male patriarchy, Hinduism, uh, you know, there is fear of that in among the women. And they would constantly bring out rape victims and whatever, whatever going on and blame it on Hinduism and some woman got burnt or whatever happened, you know. So they would do that. Victimhood, parading victimhood. And now, at about 15, 20 years ago, this took a new turn and caste was added. And then... Uh, then after 9-11, when the Muslims joined the leftists to create this woke movement in the United States, Muslims were added. Uh, so, so Christians were added. So now, you know, the, 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 you cannot go with, you can, just cannot make the case that there is no Hindu phobia. Because if you say there is no Hindu phobia, then you are saying that Hindus are not being accused of being oppressors. And, and murderers and rapists. But, uh, you know, uh, Suraj Yengde at Harvard goes around giving talks that uh, uh, 500,000, 5 lakh uh, Dalit women have been raped by Brahmins, uh, according to him, in the last 10 years. I mean, he just come up with all these kind of wild al allegations. So we have to, uh, we have to call them Hindu phobics. Now, <clears throat> again, phobia is in itself it means it's an irrational fear where there is no basis of it. So if we say that these people genuinely fear Hindus because they believe that Hindus are oppressors, even then, do you think that there is some sort of dissonance between what we think they feel, which is fear of Hindus because they genuinely believe that Brahmins were oppressors or Hindus were oppressors, so on and so forth, and the word phobia, which essentially means it's an irrational fear, because one of the arguments that uh, has been put forth by those who are talking about the term Hindumesia is that we are not just talking about hate speech. We're not just talking about criticism like, you know, those talking about Islamophobia often talk about. We are talking about real life violence. We are talking about murders, rapes, beheadings, calls for, calls for genocide. Um, genuine oppression for thousands of years. So do you think the term Hindu phobia, which is an irrational fear of Hindus, is inadequate to capture this sort of institutionalized and systemic oppression of Hindus that we wish to mainstream and encompass in our narrative? Do you think it's inadequate in that way? No, no. Uh, and there are two, two parts to the conversation. First, you know, whether a phobia is rational fear or irrational fear depends on who you're asking. If I have fear of heights and I have fear of darkness and I have fear of Muslims, whether a scientific person will say it's good, logical or not, is one thing. But for me, it makes sense. You cannot talk a person who has a phobia on the basis that, you know, this is irrational, so your phobia should go away. It doesn't go away. The point is, the rationality is in the eyes of the beholder. There is a certain person who is 
says my logic is objective. I'm I'm not subject to all this, so I don't believe in all this. I think you're full of nonsense, and it's all irrational. But try telling, try convincing somebody who's suffering. So the person who the person who is has this X Y whatever phobia believes that it's realistic. Believes that it's reasonable, and so that is where the term how the term in practice is being used how the term is getting emotional currency you have to look at a term getting emotional currency rather than scientifically logically whether that's true or false it may be totally false but it it the program is not what was applicable to what hindus were doing it may be logically scientifically wrong but if if you can get away with it if you can build that kind of an aura around a certain brand you can use it and it it's a power word so i'm 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 basically saying that the second level is pragmatic if i can turn hindu phobia and give it the same currency as islamophobia has as long as i can do it for the law, in the legal situation as long as if there's a panel discussion at princeton university discussing islamophobia and i write to the organizers saying can i also be a panelist or at least ask a question from the audience about hindu phobia it's very difficult for them to refuse it it's just a pragmatic matter where it doesn't have anything to do with what's the logic i think the people who are promoting hindu misi are, are splitting hair too much about the logic behind it but in media and in emotions and in uh, in what what uh, becomes eventually turns into law it's not all those things that matter what matters is the people's feelings and how can you arouse people's feelings Uh, to give us sympathy the way the muslims are getting sympathy and how do you uh, arouse people's feelings to give us protection legal protection uh, the way muslims are getting legal protection when they are being criticized and the criticism of islam which gets immediately branded as islamophobia is not just fear of islam if i say that uh, uh, you know that this uh, Uh, Eid uh, teaches you uh, slitting throats because you have to worship uh, halal. Halal is a uh, cruel, and halal halal is against animal rights. And and uh, uh, when you practice halal and you keep slitting throats slowly, 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 then you know one day it's easy for you to click, slit the throat of a human being who's an infidel. And so therefore you are programming these young boys uh, using this halal to become killers. If I say that, you know that is Islamophobic. so it is it is any disparaging any anything that says uh, that if we if you say hypothetically that prophet muhammad didn't exist and they just made it up now that's not fear that's just saying this all bullshit but that would be called islamophobia so the current the, the currency of islamophobia is has to do with the wide range of applications not limited to okay whether i'm afraid of islam and all that they don't they don't say that that the test of islamophobia is whether you are afraid of islam you make fun of the prophet you are islamophobic now in the in again, fact in uh, fact, uh, the, in, yeah. fact, in, fact yeah. i tell you in fact i tell you the us commission on international religious freedom which was started by the clinton administration and i i'm the only hindu i know of who actually goes to them actually washington dc goes to the headquarters sits with the commissioners argues with them and writes back my rebuttal i've done that on multiple occasions so on one of these occasions this was years ago before covid when i went there and they had this report on uh, uh, you know islamophobia in india okay so they had this report uh, accusing uh, you know india india hindus and all that of, of islamophobia so i started taking it apart one of them was one of the clauses was that uh, uh, they are banning beef they are banning beef and i said what does that have to do with islamophobia see banning beef doesn't mean you have fear of islam you're not banning beef is that uh, you know you want to protect cows and this and that so they said this lady there is she is this white lady very leftist kind of very angry kind of at me you know so she said uh, she is one of those commissioners so she said that uh, uh, you are denying them the right to practice their religion that's why it's a violation so i said then we got this argument on whether beef eating is required in islam it turns out the quran doesn't say that you have to eat beef in fact uh, uh, cow is a tropical animal it's not a desert animal 
they don't have cows in uh, the time of Muhammad. It was a luxury to uh, only some very super rich people would import cattle, you know, cows. They ate goat and camel. So during the Muslim, uh, you know, holidays or whatever ritual, for whatever reason, whenever they would eat meat, it was not beef. So I told her that. I said that, you know, if you ban beef eating, that is nothing to do with Islamophobia. So you see the, how the word Islamophobia has traveled and become so pervasive that, you, that I, our conversation had nothing to do with fearing Islam. It had to do with protecting cows. And she felt that denying them the ritual that the religion requires them, to, you know, is there for Islamophobia. So this is what, what you have to understand. The, the meaning of the word phobia cannot be taken literally uh, when we figure out whether a word is useful. Yeah, so when you were talking about Islam and the Quran, for example, and when you were talking about um, Islam's prophet, my heart skipped a beat and I felt genuine fear. And that fear is not irrational because when you make such statements, you have thousands and lakhs of Muslims taken to the streets saying, Gusta ke Rasul ki ek saza sartan se juda. And that's where my problem essentially. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little confused whether Hindu phobia is an all encompassing term because we can legitimately say that the fear of Islam is not irrational. The fear of Islam is genuine because there have been thousands and lakhs of people who've lost their lives because of the doctrine of Islam. And there haven't been people who have lost their lives because Hindus choose to follow the religion that they do. And therefore, the Fears, so called, is completely irrational. And I don't know how the two can go hand in hand where you see, discredit the one is, but yeah, use see, the, the other. Yeah, I understand. But see, the thing is that Misia is hardly a term that anybody in India knows. And it's hardly a term that anybody is going to start using. Uh, it's going to become some very esoteric, a few people who will talk to themselves, talk to each other, and they feel very proud. We've got coined a new term. We must be very smart and pat each other's back. But good luck trying to make it mainstream the way we main, mainstream Hindu phobia in many, many circles. In, you know, it, we still have a long way to go to get on par with Islamophobia. But every time they talk Islamophobia, we bring in Hindu phobia and we, we score points. Uh, Hindu Misia, nobody knows what the heck it is. Our own people even don't even know what the heck it is. Go to some, go to any guru and you say Hindu phobia, they'll understand it. Go to any RSS fellow, you say, you know, I'm accusing these people of Hindu phobia. Talk to them, any uh, Indian consulate anywhere, they'll understand it. Okay. Uh, more and more people are understanding it. Hindu Misia, you're going to start at square one. And, you know, we are so good at fragmenting. And, start, and, and for the sake of being very theoretically pure and all that, we start something, it never goes anywhere. It will probably decorate a few uh, websites and a few, you know, letterheads of people who become uh, advisor and director and trustee of this or that organization to do with Hindu VC and all that. But it has very little chance of making an impact in the world. And it really has nothing to do with what it means. Besides, it's not even our word. It's not even our word. It's not even it's not alien to our languages. Misia. What does Misia? You know, phobia also is alien, but it's a very common word. You know, because the people have understood, and 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 I think it's a very clever idea to piggyback on Islamophobia and just go for it. And I and I think that when Suraj Jengde starts saying that five hundred thousand uh, Dalits have, women have been raped by Muslims and therefore I mean by Hindus, Brahmins, and therefore they should be we should be denied our rights as, as Hindus, he is spreading Hindu phobia uh, because that is what he is spreading. Whether, whether it is rational or not, I remind you, is irrelevant. Whether it is backed by hard data is irrelevant. You see, you, while Islamophobia, you could say, okay, it's backed by hard evidence because they did kill. My father was in Lahore and barely made it to India during partition. And he was, he was very young. He was a young man, just newly married. And uh, many members of his family did not make it. My father luckily did. Okay. And my mother was in Ludhiana on the, on the Indian side. And they thought that these people are, are dead. So, you know, it's in my family. I understand this. I understand Islamophobia. I definitely understand it. And I understand that Islamophobia is rational. Hindu phobia is not rational. Okay. Islamophobia is backed by facts. I can legitimately say I am Islamophobic and I have a right to be. I can say that because my father almost died. And these were the stories taught to me since childhood. You're okay. So if I am the son of victims, 
I have a right to fear that. It's, a, it's normal. I mean, a woman who's been raped or her mother has, was raped, she's, she's going to be f- fearful of rapists. You cannot accuse her. That, hey, you're fearing rapists. She'll say, yeah, I'm fearing rapists. And for a good reason. So I have a right to be Islamophobic, I could argue. Okay. And, 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 but I, and I don't think that Suraj Yengde can make the same argument that he has a right to be Hindu phobic. Okay. But that's the argument they're making. So that's the argument that, uh, you know, Sandhya Rajan is making and all these people are making that they have a logical, based on data, they keep fabricating this data, that they have a right to be Hindu phobic. Okay. Because they, they, it's all logic that the uh, data based that uh, Hindus and Brahmins and all that have been killing uh, Muslims and killing Dalits and raping women and all that stuff. So it's a war of uh, claims and counterclaims. And it's not a, it's not that there is the truth that everybody believes. You believe in a certain truth about Islam. And in fact, a lot of historians deny that. You know that a lot of historians deny this whole business about whether Ghazni came and killed all those people or not. There, a lot of them say that Muslims came to liberate the Dalits. That's the idea. The argument, the leftist argument of Indian history is that uh, caste system oppressed the people. Brahmins oppressed the people. Muslims came to liberate and the reason the Hindus failed to defend themselves is because they, the only the uh, upper caste wanted to fight. The lower caste was very happy that, oh, wow, these guys are come to liberate us. Now, it may be ridiculous, but that's the narrative. So, you see, we cannot, uh, we cannot say that uh, in one case, the fear is there. In the other case, the fear is not there. The point is, when it comes to Hinduism, they're spreading Hindu phobia. Intensely, that's the whole woke movement today to spread Hindu phobia. Even claiming that we are doing pogroms is a way to spread Hindu phobia, and we should call it that. We should say by making the allegation of pogroms, you are being Hindu phobic. That's what we should say. Right. So I agree with you. It is Hindu phobic because it is irrational what they are claiming because they're not back yes. to facts. Yes. And your fear of Islam, for example, or my fear of Islam is not Islamophobic because it's rational. There is a basis for that fear. And uh, that, that, that is where my confusion lies. But what I understand so you saying I, is... See, see I, I would say that I would say whether the fear is rational or irrational should not be the point. If a community has fear of something, Whatever it may be due to, it may be logical, illogical, maybe pro- bad propaganda, maybe whatever. Uh, as long as a, a community has fear of something, you know, there is that phobia. Okay. Uh, and so what we are being told is that Muslims have Hindu phobia. They say it's justified. Dalits have Hindu phobia. Uh, women are being persecuted. Christians, all of these people got Hindu phobia. That is how they are, they are going after Hindus by making that allegation. You and I can say it's irrational. We don't have a problem. No. As long as they got the uh, the bullhorn, they got the, uh, they got the microphone, they got the uh, international media, they got the uh, social media under their control, they got the legal systems under their control, the human rights uh, administrators under their control, even the Indian uh, uh, Chandrachud, the Supreme Court justice are, 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 are part of this. As long as the power structure of knowledge and uh, legal things and policy things is controlled by certain people who believe there is legitimacy in accusing Hindus, okay, They're in accusing Hindus and having uh, as people that uh, have uh, committed crimes, okay, as long as they can get away with it, and and they're talking about it all the time in Tamil Nadu, some um, government people are talking like that, you know, Stalin and his people are talking like that. As long as that is the case, I have a right to say those are Hindu phobic. They should not be is another matter. Their, 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 their Hindu phobia is irrational. It's a false propaganda. That's a different matter. But the fact that they are making those claims uh, makes them Hindu phobic. So what I understand you saying is that um, logically the um, epidemiology of the the word phobia and the word nisya doesn't really matter because islamophobia has come to mean fear and hatred 
combined of Muslims, for example. Rational, irrational, it doesn't matter. Whether the word phobia means rational or irrational, it doesn't matter. What you're saying is because of repeated usage and because of how the Muslim Brotherhood has used it, because of how the left has used it, the term Islamophobia itself has come to uh, mean a combined fear and hatred of the Muslim community. And therefore, we should be taking from that, we should be piggybacking on that lexicon and sticking to yes. Hindu phobia without, you know, squabbling over whether phobia is irrational fear or rational fear, etc. Yes, I do. I think do you summarize my you summarize my position okay. brilliantly. Uh, that's exactly my position. I'm a pragmatist. I don't want mm -hmm. to be a purist theoretically. I mean, I can fight a theoretical game also. But I think that uh, in the in the world of marketing, uh, pr brands are very pragmatic. Brands are extremely mm -hmm. pragmatic. You've figured out the psychology of people. So right now, the world is in this mode of political correctness. And when you accuse somebody of something uh, which where you've come up with a scary uh, connotation, uh, he wants to say, oh, no, no, I, I'll avoid that and I'll take the safe mm -hmm. route. I want to create Hindu phobia like that. That, you know, hey, listen, in fact, I'm coming up with the rankings of Hindu phobic people. I'm developing, you, you're mm. doing that too. We're going to do that. Uh, we, are, we have a Hindu phobia of the year award. We should give somebody. Uh, we should uh, have a conference on who are the top 10 Hindu phobics this year. Uh, and we should keep pushing back on them. And, and it is not about whether their fear is rational or irrational. I don't care. As long as they are disparaging uh, my tradition, I'm going to fight back using the same ammunition that the Muslims are fighting. That's It's as simple as that. It's all about right. re respect for uh, our f identity uh, that can be passed on to the next generation. Uh, whereas these uh, these allegations, true or false, even if they're true, doesn't matter. They're going to prevent uh, current generation from passing it on to the next generation, that particular identity. Nobody wants to be associated with an identity that has such negative baggage. So it's a fight for, it's a smear war, smear campaign against uh, each other. And that's the way that life is. And so I'm a very pragmatic person. You want to call me Islamophobic, I'm going to call you Hinduphobic, for sure. And I'm going to come up with my criteria uh, for, for escaping Hinduphobic branding. I'm going to come up with my criteria. And, and otherwise, yeah. I'm going to go after you. And I, and I have millions of people now who want to back me in this. I worked very hard for it for 30 years. So I, I would not give it up. Now, Rajiv, sir, as far as Hindu media is concerned, there are certain crimes, there are hate crimes. So Hindu phobia, if we talk about using that term when there is hate speech against Hindus, calls for genocide, etc., it would still, um, you know, fit somewhere. But when you start talking about hate crimes, for example, I've you know repeatedly spoken about this case where a young girl, 14 year old, she was being gang raped, for example. And she kept saying, Mujhe Bhagwan ke liye chhodo. And the rapist kept saying, nahi, nahi, you have to say, Mujhe Allah ke liye chhodo. Now that is not um, phobia that drove those rapists to rape that poor Hindu girl. It was absolute unbridled hate for a kafir girl that drove them to rape her now do you think as far as hate crimes are concerned hindu phobia as a term is again inadequate and maybe we should differentiate that hate speech is hindu phobia but hate crimes we perhaps need to discuss what we could call it we could perhaps call it crimes against hindus um hindu hate crimes hate crimes against hindus so on and so forth if not hindu media but do you think See, that that differentiation and categorization should be there? So, you know, if you look at Christianity, Christianity's, yeah. uh, uh, Christianity's hatred for infidels is because there's a fear. There's a fear that uh, the, 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 this, uh, they're spoiling the... It's a collective salvation in Christianity. It's a collective salvation. And these infidels are spoiling the game for everybody. So it is fear. So the fact that you don't believe in Jesus and is, is spoiling my chance also. You see, the, 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 it's a collective bargain that God has given. And I, I've been asked to get you in line. I have to force you to stand in line, get back in on track, 
and become a Christian, become a believer, because your disbelief is harming me. You are causing me harm. I, I am I, I, I'm afraid of uh, my hatred for you is because it big, it's a problem for me. You see, this is Hindus don't understand it because in our case, my, my we have a reincarnation system. It's not like we're all going to go this way or that way kind of thing. And so under the reincarnation system, you go to hell or you come back and be born in, a, in another life in some way. I am not bothered. I, I am going to go uh, in my next life. If there is one will be based on my karma and if maybe not even have a next life, if I'm, I don't have to go through that again. So my the worldview we have, the cosmology we have, it gives an individual more freedom. In, there is more individual freedom more, uh, you know, you're not contingent on other people. And the collectivism that is part of all the Abrahamic religions, uh, because God gives covenants collectively. And that is why there is this uh, tendency that certain people will go around the world conquering others and getting them to be converted because it is required. <laughs> so I think the uh, common man's hatred is out of greed. He just wants this guy's gold chain. That's all. Okay, whether it is against this one or that one, that's all it is. But the ideological foundation for it is based on this this fear of disobedience to God, because God has God has mandated and ordered us to go and do certain things we cannot disobey, and the kafir has to be treated a certain way. We cannot be allowed into the Kaaba. It's not just hatred for him; it is fear of disobedience. So ultimately. These religions live on fear. They are based, the whole Abrahamic tradition, Abrahamic religious driving force is fear. God is a fearful guy. Okay, uh, so he, the, this, uh, all the commandments and injunctions and surahs are to put fear in people and make the, and drive them in a certain direction. And so whenever they have this attitude towards somebody and all that, they may pretend, you know, I don't like your rationality, you know, you're a nice guy. But deep down, unconsciously, they have so much fear. So what you're saying is their hatred towards Hindus and what drives them to commit these crimes against Hindus, whether it's the rape, whether it's the beheading, whether it's the forced conversion, so on and so forth, forced feeding beef, for example, is not... I mean, the hatred of Hindu is there, but the hatred of Hindu is a product of de their fear of their vengeful God. That their if they obedience. don't follow those commandments, yes. then they are not going to get the Jannah, their 72 hoods, so on and so forth, whatever their religion promises them in their right. afterlife. So, right. so They're I, not going to get that. Yeah. Hmm. So I think there's two levels. There is an unconscious level, which is fear. That is the driver, the primary driver in the Abrahamic religions is fear. I mean, that's clear to me. Now, that manifests in many ways. You can manifest it and make it look like, the, the, hey, we are positive people. You know, we are all positive. This is all po we, uh, we, we, are, we want to embrace everybody. You can turn it into, uh, into a conscious, at the conscious level, you can make it look very politically correct and you can make it look like very reasonable and, and scientific and rational. You're doing all these things. But that is just a surface level. That is a surface level on which you can say, I, the reason I hate you is because, you know, you guys are not very clean or you guys are uh, uh, polluting because of Diwali crackers. You know, I, I, I like that. Those are all surface manifestations which can may come in the form of hatred, disliking, logically arguing against them. But underneath all that is fear. And the person may not even be aware that he's driven by fear because this has been coming down for so long. And this has been put into him. When the kid is very young, he's beaten up and told, you do this, you do this, and don't do that. I mean, he's, it's all through Danda. And it's all through Danda because the, the dad or whoever is in charge has, feels that uh, God has empowered him to do God's Danda. Man is doing God's Danda. I mean, uh, I remember... Uh, a uh, uh, living room conversation with uh, Ram Jethmalani. You know, I used to, uh, Rani Jethmalani's daughter, Ram Jethmalani, uh, when they lived in this Akbar Road, like, I used to go there and have a lot of time, good times, many, many evenings. Now, Rani had 
adopted a young Muslim boy. I don't know if you know this, but Rani had adopted a Muslim boy. Uh, she found him in her train and she brought him and illegally adopted him and uh, all that. So he was always present. And there would be this uh, fiery debate between Ram Jetmalani and his son. And Ram Jetmalani would give him hell on many of the things that we are talking about. That, you know, he would make this point that because you have this fear, you are driven into all kind of, uh, you're projecting the fear on others, you know, you're blaming these kafirs, uh, you don't want to work hard and feel that you're a victim. Uh, basically, the fear is crippling you and handicapping you and preventing you from uh, working hard and uh, doing well in life. And look at the, your, he was very open about it. He would say, your Hindu uh, uh, classmates are able to outperform because they don't have this fear. They're, they're out of uh, freedom. They're more free. So I, I think there is a, a, a fear. I've seen this fear in Jews and Christians whom I've known for most of my life living in this country. I also have Muslim friends. And, and I tell you, the Muslim friends are so slick and so charming and so nice and uh, congenial, very hospitable. They got beautiful homes and they are, they are so friendly and loving and they're there for you. They'll give you a ride. They'll take you somewhere. They'll lavishly entertain you. They're really nice about that. If you start peeling the onion layers and start sitting with one or two of them, you know, and going in it a little bit, little bit, that fear comes out and they don't want to talk anymore. They stop the conversation. They, they stop the conversation because that you're taking them to a place they don't want to go to. So I think we need to understand their vulnerabilities also, their psychological vulnerabilities. It's, uh, and when we, when, we, when we are able to articulate clearly with evidence, the fear as a driving force in all their religious books, that is the primary driving force. And the fear of damnation, you know, the fear of damnation, the fear of hell. I mean, they're, they're, they're different in the three traditions. They have different kinds of ways that God is fearful and condemning and all that stuff. But that is the reality in all of them. So then you would propose that Hindu phobia as a term is used not just for hate speech, but also hate crime. So we say it's a Hindu phobic attack. It's a Hindu phobic crime. Um, it's a Hindu phobic hate speech and so on and so forth. So do you think the word Hindu Mesia should be abandoned completely? Because I was researching while uh, I was preparing for this interview. And I realized that a lot of leftists are now actually trying to mainstream Mesia as a suffix. So a lot of the trans community, the LGBTQ community is trying to mainstream Mesia saying that transphobia or homophobia is a term which is not encompassing and it's not adequate to, in their mind, describe the kind of hate that uh, members of the LGBTQ community uh, get um, on a global stage. So they are trying to mainstream the term Mesia. So do you think this is the point where we should completely drop Hindumesia as a project yeah, I, I, and stick I think, to Hindophobia? I, I think so. And I, I think that uh, for, I know a lot of the trans people. I mean, I talk to them. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I have a lot of in interactions with them. They don't, I mean, the average person feels that uh, differently. He feels that, you know, there is this uh, sense that uh, if you look at the right wing, if you look at in the American context, the right wing, Republican right wing, fight against uh, LGBTQ in the, in, and trans in the school systems, it is fear. It is fear that this is contaminating our family values. Uh, it is contaminating being a good Christian. Uh, because you, you can ask them, why are, you, why are you concerned your kid goes to school and the other people are like that? Why should you be bothered? And you, there is a fear that it is entering our lives. It will destroy our society. There is the fear of uh, LGBTQ kind of... Uh, making us less Christian, less loving, uh, you know, normal, less normal. There is that fear. So uh, that the LGBTQ people saying, okay, all you guys have a trans phobia and whatever, whatever, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're from their point of view, that, that makes sense. I don't think that that, that is going to go away, that, that kind of a branding is going to go away in the near future. So Hindus should simply drop 
Hindumisia as a project and stop trying to reinvent the wheel, stick to Hindu phobia. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, we should drop uh, Hindumisia as a project yes. and stick to Hindu phobia as because far as Mexico is concerned. This whole Misia business is just a few years old. You know, and, yeah. and it's ironic, the, first, the same people tried something else first. I won't name names, but first they tried saying that uh, this Raji Malhotra never came up with Hindu phobia. We, he should not be uh, given any credit for it. Hindu phobia so and so had, so and so also mentioned. It was more like uh, trying to claim words as if that matters, you know. So I, I, I let me also tell you one thing. My life contribution is not about coining words. Even though this conversation is on how important coining words is, I am more interested in discovering the phenomenon itself, the algorithm which which describes that word. What is the algorithm of Hinduphobia? Why? What is the? Is it Freudian psychoanalysis as a lens that drives them in this direction? Is it the, this? Is it Christianity? Is it what is it? What are the mechanisms? What are the funding mechanisms that are driving it? What are the political mechanisms, pragmatic mechanisms? What are the financial mechanisms that are driving it? I'm more interested in understanding it as a phenomena and whatever you call it, you call it. I happen to pick pragmatic terms to, to describe the things. You know, like for instance, I, I feel that uh, our people just didn't want to study enough about the other side because we felt that we, I have the truth in my heart and we've had the truth for 5,000 years and why should I worry about others and I don't believe in being negative. So I found that the word Purva Paksha was very pragmatic. I could go to everyone to the Shankaracharya all downwards and say, you know, we have a tradition of Purva Paksha. We have to study others. Uh, that is what we our, our rishis were do good at. That is that they were good at debating. We cannot say that I don't care about what others are thinking. We have to care about what others are thinking. And then you have to educate society how to debate, how to argue back. So connecting it with our tradition. I didn't invent the term Purva Paksha, but I applied it to in today's context in a way that it had not been applied. So, you know, I'm a pragmatist. I'm, I, I look at an issue, I look at a situation and I figure out what's the right way to, uh, to tackle it and push back. And I come up with some solution and it may require coining a new term or it may require re refurbishing an old term, uh, you know, repurposing an old term for a new application. Whatever it takes, I just want to build movements where our young people uh, are able to join in on a large scale without necessarily having to be too erudite. I, I write very heavy books for scholars, but I also spend a lot of energy trying to simplify it for the masses so that people, a large number of people can join in. Both, both these domains are important. So actually, I did try to research where um, Hindumisia actually started, and I couldn't come up with an answer because I couldn't uh, sort of go back in time and trace that trajectory. But I do realize it's a new phenomenon. It's just been maybe three, four years that a lot of people are trying to perhaps talk about it in mainstream. It's, I didn't know the backstory that uh, there has been that conversation about Hindu phobia versus Hindu Misia as far as those who are trying to mainstream that term versus you who's worked on Hindu phobia. However, my last question is, Say Hindus get together and decide that, all right, we are going to use Hindu Misia, just hypothetically. What kind of momentum do you think are we going to lose, for, lose with that? And what um, effect would the cluttering of terminology, so to speak, have on the momentum that we've already built so far? So, you know, the thing is, let's say, let's you do the scenario that you're talking about, that uh, the, these guys continue pursuing Hindu Misia, fine. I mean, I, they can do anything they want. Uh, it, it's just that Hindu phobia has a life of its own. It is way ahead. And that's not going to stop. I mean, there are Hindu phobia, uh, you know, mentions in the Canadian. There's some bill going on and they're, they're, they're putting it in the, in, in the school district here. Uh, there are some school districts that have... Uh, uh, included uh, a sensitivity on Hindu phobia as part of that, that that term is there as part of the curriculum. So, you know, we are getting in there. So that by so the Hindu Misia people, by the time they are where we are already are with Hindu phobia, it may be many, many years if they ever get there. And in the meantime, Hindu phobia, the idea of building awareness of Hindu phobia will go even further. I mean, now there are in the American Academy of Religion, 
uh, they have uh, formed these committees to say that, you know, we should be honest and we should also self-introspect and whether we really have Hindu phobia. I mean, now these, the guys who are on the other side, uh, the Wendy Donigas of the world, I'm retired, retiring, or they're very old, and you know they fought this with me, and they lost all this stuff. Then they put the next generation, like Audrey Truske type people, to fight, continue the fight. But the Audrey Truske type people, thanks to our activism against them, what has happened is polarized their camp. There are for every one Audrey or Truske, there is there are one, two, three, four others who don't want to get uh, labeled, who don't want this branding. They just don't want to, uh, you know, Audrey Truske has a hard time getting people on her panels. You think that she's that powerful. She is a very uh, violent kind of intellectually, in the intellectual sense, a very violent kind of person, a very negative, full of hatred and all that. And she's definitely a Hindu phobic. The thing is that uh, she has not the unanimous support of her own uh, uh, you know, peer group. Many people in that, uh, in Rutgers University where she is and other universities where she goes and talks and all that, tell me that they want to stay away from her very nicely and politely. They don't want to be in a fight with anybody, but they do not want to be co-branded with her because they think that maybe she's got enough support, enough church support or whatever who's supporting her, so she'll be okay. But if we latch on to her, if we are associated with her, we don't have the same support and we'll be screwed. We don't want to do that. So a lot of people are actually abandoning her. So it is working. It is what it is working. Uh, you know, so if it's working, let it continue. But I'm not concerned. See, I'm 73 years old and I've had a 30, 35 years of all this. And so I'm moving on. I have to now pack my bags and uh, turn over. I'm writing, by the way, next year, just to let you know, Infinity Foundation turns 30, 30 years old. So we've been at it longer than anyone else. We've started most of these new things long before today's generation even knew about these problems. So I have to turn this over to new people. We have, I have to produce at least 20 more books I have to finish that I've started. A lot of them with new kind of uh, movements and new initiatives. Uh, t totally new domains of uh, research and investigation. I have to finish that. Train a lot of young people. I uh, would love to have you join us as one of the bright young future leaders. You are highly promising. I know that. Uh, but we have we are doing that. So for me, you know, uh, at this point in time, it doesn't matter if somebody starts another movement. They call it Hindu Misi or whatever. You know, more power to them. Bless them. I, I have no problem of any kind. It doesn't really affect me. I, I just have to finish my work and move on and 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 let others do whatever they do. Uh, the future belongs to young people and they should decide for themselves. Um, I hope we do come to the right decision collectively because it is becoming increasingly import important for um, the global community to realize the kind of hate and violence the Hindu community has faced for decades and centuries. In fact, again, recently, I think Hindus are being endangered over and over and over again when the Hitler hooked cross is conflated with the Hindu holy swastika, for example. And these little threads of hatred and fear towards Hindus, it keeps endangering our community almost on a regular basis. So, um, so I would say, I would years, say yeah. so I would, but, but before I forget, sorry for the interruption, uh, Nupur. Yeah. Uh, before I forget, you've just given a very good example. Uh, you know, yes. fear of swastika is not a hatred in some kind of rational or, you know, it's a it's a fear of swastika based on completely bogus grounds, completely bogus grounds. Here is an example of Hindu phobia. Of, you know, every Hindu in the United States, I mean, I went to my car, I, I just got a new car, so I went to the temple and I put a nice swastika. I had the Pandit bless. It's on the front of my car. And I, I have no problem with it. I have a swastika hanging in various places here and there. I have no problem with it. I have no, because I can explain. I can argue. I look for an opportunity when somebody picks on me and says, oh, no, what well, is this? Then I'll give them, i give them a long story. And they'll say, okay, okay, fine. You. <laughs> I don't, I don't lose easily. Okay. So, so the point is that I see as somebody who has a, a swastika various places around me in my life, I see that uh, there is uh, that swastika is a sort of a, a hatred for swastika 
uh, is a kind of a Hindu phobic thing. It is all phobia about, you know, these Nazis, uh, the, uh, the RSS are wearing these uh, uh, shorts, these khaki shorts, uh, and they are like they have a neo, they have a Nazi background and all that. It is fear. Uh, the propaganda against RSS is a phobia. There is RSS phobia. There is no doubt about it. There is Brahmin phobia. There is no doubt about it. Brahmin phobia exists. So you know, Hindu phobia is a kind of a catch-all, very generic kind of broad umbrella that captures all of these. There is phobia, there is phobia of, uh, uh, you know, there is a whole movement that says that mm -hmm. Ram is a male oppressor, is a male dominant guy, a female oh, yeah. oppressor, Sita was oppressed, and there is a Ram phobia movement definitely going on. There is, there, so there is all of this, uh, there, is a, there is a Sanskrit phobia. In fact, I wrote an article. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article, uh, I just discovered this, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, Sanskrit phobia and geopolitics. I, I wrote this article and published it in 2005 in the Journal of Sanskrit Studies, which uh, I launched and Infinity Foundation funded this uh, journal in Thailand in 2005. Uh, they, this was launched by the by the crown princess, the the uh, you know the king's daughter, and uh, so I I wrote this whole thing about the, the phobia being propagated, irrational of course, uh, that Sanskrit is a violent language. It is, uh, it has been oppressive and it it preaches uh, violence against certain communities and things like that. And this uh, Sheldon Pollock. Uh, was actually one of the pioneers in uh, bringing that message, uh, that interpretation of Sanskrit. And that is why I did not want him to take over the Shingeri chair and all those things and take over Sanskrit studies. And that is why I wrote uh, The Battle for Sanskrit, uh, to fight back that Sanskrit phobia. So there are these uh, very dangerous hatred based on fear and fear-mongering. There is that. So, uh, Rajiji, it's been 30 years next year uh, that you've been running uh, your foundation. And, and by the way, you have to and, come. You yeah. have you have to you have to come. It'll be in August, and I'm telling the I'm I'm I want to promise from you uh, in front of your audience. You have to come uh, and be part of the celebration of our 30th anniversary. We we expect about 2,000 people, and uh, okay. uh, you must come. And 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 I hope many other people will also come. We want to do it on a big I scale. Really the That's whole history of this movement from 30 years, we yeah. want to put it on display. Where we are now, what is our vision for the future? Launch a whole lot of new pro pro programs. We're, we're working very hard to announce many new pro programs at that event. So uh, I'll let you know the date and you cannot uh, miss it, please. My request. I will, no, not at all, sir. I will certainly be there. And uh, I hugely admire you. And like I've always said, people like me or even people who've been working in this field for 10 years more than I have, I'm just 10 years old. We stand on the shoulder of giants and we always learn. And um, I'm happy that we could have this conversation. I perhaps have a lot, lot more clarity on the terms Hinduphobia and Hindumisia, and I hope that our audience has as well. So thank you so much, Rajivji. I will see you in August when we celebrate 30 years of the foundation. Yes, and before that, uh, sometime early early in 2024, I'll be visiting Delhi and I would love to uh, invite you and we'll sit down and talk and do other things. And before that, I'm sure we'll have a more conversations online also. And I want to tell uh, viewers that uh, Nupur is an exceedingly sharp, clear, uh, straight you know, shooter. Uh, and I've really enjoyed reading her stuff uh, and enjoy uh, interacting with her. Uh, so uh, it, it's been a delight. It's, I really enjoyed this conversation because you brought out some. You forced me to think uh, and and uh, argue, and I, and and I, and that's the best. You know, I really like a logical, penetrating analysis or uh, uh, you know, uh, critiquing my thinking, and that gets the best out of me. So uh, people can agree, disagree, but that's the best I have to offer. And b this is what we ought to be doing: is bringing the best out, out of each other. And thank you very much for doing Absolutely. that. Thank you so much, Rajiti. Thank you so much for the time you've given. And thank you for your extremely kind and tall words. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste.